Welcome to the Fitness Plus Technology Podcast for club owners, operators, and fitness professionals. Each week, host Brian O'Rourke brings you an expert interview with a global influencer at the crossroads of fitness and technology. You gain the insights, tools, and inspiration you need to stay connected to the pulse for what matters most for your business in the age of exponential technologies. Welcome, listeners. I'm your host, Brian O'Rourke, and I appreciate you joining the podcast today. Well, it is February of 2023, and we have some great shows coming up. I hope to see you in San Diego uh, from the 20th to the 23rd, I think Monday through that Thursday, for the URSA convention. That is going to be fantastic. I will be speaking Tuesday afternoon on what's next. There'll be a lot of other great speakers and attendees at that show. Look at the show notes uh, for details, and I hope to see you there. As well, I will be in Cologne, Germany, for FIBO. And on the 12th of April, um, I'll be at the Health and Fitness uh, Forum put on by Europe Active, and the event, of course, is uh, March uh, 13th through the 16th in Cologne. Uh, I'll be speaking at a few events, doing some things there, so I hope to see you. If you'd like to see me at either of the shows, you can contact me directly at brianklrourke at gmail.com. So I do hope to see you there. Well, today's interview was a great one, uh, being put on with me by the founder of Sweatworks, uh, Mo Iqbal, who I, I'm sure you might have heard of before. We'll have links to his bio and to Sweatworks in the show notes. Um, Mo, as he's um, affectionately known, uh, and Sweatworks run a creative technology shop that helps brands uh, create products and do different things with technology. And he and I, in our conversation today, are going to explore a number of of things about technology that I think you might find very interesting, particularly given uh, his experience in developing technologies for other companies. We'll explore a few things, uh, including uh, the blockchain, uh, other things like metaverse, and other pragmatic areas of tech application. So without further ado, let's have Mo on the show. Well, hello, listeners, and thanks again for joining us. As I was mentioning on the intro, we have with us a Mo from Sweatworks. Good afternoon, Mo. How are you doing today? Hey, Brian. I'm doing great. I really appreciate you making time. Um, I enjoyed our uh, chat in advance of uh, the pod as well, and I know our listeners uh, will really enjoy some of your insights. Would you mind sharing a little bit about your background and how Sweatworks came to be, and what are some of the things you're working on? Yeah, for, first of all, Brian, thank you so much for having me on. I've been a longtime listener. I've I've followed you and, and some other industry legends. So I think being on is a real honor, and I really appreciate it. Um, just to give you some background on myself and Sweatworks, let me start with that. I was born in Dubai and migrated uh, to the States in 1991. I came here when I was 11. So do the math. You can figure out how old I am. Um, and I think in that journey really helped the foundation of ultimately what became this company, which I founded in 2012. So I came here when I was 11. I came from a Dubai that wasn't what it was today, right? It was a very different Dubai. It was still um, a a melting pot of different cultures. It was still a trade capital in the Gulf. But look, when you're looking at TV stations, I had four. I came here and I had over a hundred. Um, I had a few types of cereal. I, I came here and we had this massive grocery stores. Um, so I was inundated with a lot of choices that I didn't have to make before. And I think naturally, mm-hmm. uh, my family just lived an active lifestyle. I, I walked to school. I ate relatively healthy foods. So the first thing I noticed when I came here is within a couple of years, from 11 to 13, I put on a ton of weight. A ton of weight. Why? Mm-hmm. I was eating Cocoa Pebbles, right? This thing was amazing. I had, you know... T- cereal with like that tasted like chocolate milk after a few minutes with a toy in it. Um, I went nuts. So I ended up eating literally a box a day, discovered Coca-Cola, like the wholesome goodness. That's actually a true story. Uh, coming from Emirates to JFK airport, the first thing that I had out of the gate and first thing I smelt was a Cinnabon store. So I came out, 
And I, and I, and I go after this smell. I'm like, dad, what is this? I see Philippon. I take a bite. I'm like, America's the best country in the world. <laughs> this is incredible. But I think ultimately what happened is I end up, you know, kind of shifting away from this really healthy diet and active lifestyle, not even knowing it into something that was a bit unhealthy, put on a lot of weight. And then that's where my wellness journey started. So I picked up a book called Optimum Sports Nutrition, which came out in 1993. Uh, I still read it from time to time. And that kind of set the foundation of my understanding of macro and micronutrients. And through that, um, ended up joining high school sports, then did collegiate sports, then started a 10-year career with a large electronics company. Um, and wellness has always been a core part of kind of what kept me going. I think it helped me relate to the Western culture, help me make friends and having really healthy uh, friends as well. And after spending a decade at a large electronics company, working on some amazing projects with an awesome team, I kind of felt this urge to follow my passion, which is really health and wellness. And I wanted to find a way to help great brands, which are out there already. So um, I did my MBA at Columbia in 2008. And uh, during that, I did to have us do like a business case and something that you're not working in. And, and I selected using data and analytics to help make better decisions in health and wellness. And that ultimately is what led to the foundation of Sweatwork. So I started this agency because I had two choices um, at the time. I saw the growth of mobile internet in the 2000s and, and early 2010s. I saw the evolution of a lot of industries like Uber for cars, WhatsApp for messaging, Instagram for, for, for photos. But I saw very little evolution happening in the fitness world. So I would go into an Equinox or New York Sports Club, two clubs that were close to me at the time, and beautiful locations, great operators, really good trainers, but they weren't really leveraging digital and all these advances happening in mobile computing to help them get closer with their consumers. They were just doing operationally a fantastic job. So I saw that, hey, maybe if I could create a product-focused agency that can help these companies become digital, um, we might have a business there. So that's what led to me founding Sweatworks in 2012. That's a great, a great story. I love that story. Um, you were talking with me before our uh, pod today, and we've spoken in the past, of course, and kind of to this point, I think a good segue from your background to today. Um, we were talking about the fact that we've been around a little while, maybe longer than some, but how do you think, what do you think about the way people in business think about technology? Is, is, is that change in your view over your career? Or uh, what, what do you think people's view in business and fitness in particular, health and fitness uh, has, has done, has evolved around technology in general? Yeah, look, I mean, when I did undergrad in 1998, that was literally um, at the beginning and I was in college through the dot-com bubble. That's so true. people were kind of running away from, from technology, right? I mean, I was thinking to myself, my, and is computer science and programming the 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 wrong field to, to go into? But since then, the tides have changed. Um, and the evolution of technology used to happen every eight years, then every five years. Now it seemingly happens every two or three years. Um, if, if you look at tools like TikTok, most of us, didn't hear about TikTok three years ago, and now it's the household name. And you and I were just talking about ChatGTP as something that just came out in the fall or end of last year, literally was something that became public um, knowledge in November of last year, but was immediately hailed as the best release in technology in the entire year. Before that, you could even say uh, the, the growth of Web3, and we can get into that here in a minute. Yeah. I think technology... Um, you know, a lot of people that aren't in technology don't have to implement it or manage it or think about the security concerns around it. You typically tend to run towards the latest and greatest in a hurry without really understanding what the benefits are, what the risks are. Um, so I think we've got to be a bit more cognizant around that. So today with the advent again of advances of mobile phones, technology is everywhere, social media, um, new technology tends to spring up very, very quickly, and we tend to run to it even faster. And I could go through 
many examples. I mean, including a social media app like Clubhouse, yeah. which everyone thought was, hey, this is the next great social media app and <laughs> everyone runs to it and, it and it's not. So imagine if you're a business and you now hired a team, maybe one or two people to go manage a Clubhouse room. Um, what do you do with them now? So, yeah. yeah, no, absolutely true. Uh, the, the pace is faster and it's a little harder for people to know what's going to stick and what's not. Um, do you think that's the technology? Do you think it's the zeitgeist? Do you think it's the FOMO dynamic we were talking about? What do you, what do you, why do you think that is? Or is it a bunch of things uh, combined? So I think it's a bunch of things that has brought us to where we are today related, related to technology. And, and let me tackle that, but I do think that it's changing over the next five to 10 years. So we have seen this frothiness happen. And a lot of it, if you go way back, starts with funding and valuations. If you look yes. at yes. funding cycles of, of venture capitalists wanting to have the next round big, be bigger than the last round, and that's going to drive valuations. You drive valuations high, you're going to get attention. You look at the number of unicorns that were created you know, over the last three years, it's now decreasing. But- we created more unicorns over the last over the last 10 years each subsequent year than we did the year before that is not sustainable and in some cases you have unicorns with, with a company that has maybe 40 employees right and you have to ask yourself you know what's the value there so part of this frothiness was created by venture capitalists Great. that have this godlike status and people listen so they're out there they're promoting this next greatest technology um, and then businesses are flocking towards it without really understanding how is this really going to help my business and ultimately help my consumer. Yeah, no, I agree with you, uh, Mo. I think it's, um, um, yes, I think that that has definitely been a massive contributor to this um, disequilib uh, disequilibrium, this, this kind of gap between uh, business valuation realities and the tech underlying it and what really you know, what really is going to come from it. And I think you're spot on in your, uh, uh, in your assessment and kind of the underbelly to that. I don't know if that's the right description, but we were talking, uh, you know, earlier before the pod and, you know, this thing of legacy cost and the idea of investment and, um, and maintenance of legacy technologies. Cause on the one hand you have, uh, hype around valuations for new tech that's, you know, getting everyone's attention. On the other hand, and in our particular industry space, without naming names, there are a number of well-known brands that are literally operating their businesses on tech stacks that are literally multiple decades old. And they, they can't accelerate their business um, operations with digital components if at all, because of it. T talk about, you know, that to me is kind of like, it's interesting. Like, you know, it's, it seems like a lot of attention is being spent on the exciting new, new thing and not necessarily so much time and investment being spent on fundamental things that could make such a huge business impact. Talk about legacy. I mean, do you, what do you, I know you, in your business, you come across this. Can you share some views on that and what you think about that in general? Yeah, I, look, I think so. First of all, there's a lot to unpack there. Yes, um, we we get asked to come on and build phenomenal consumer experiences, and then tack on the China new thing. Right. So, in other words, you know, come and build me a great consumer app, and oh, by the way, can it have an NFT as a token? Right. right? So we we so we get asked to do that, and then when we we come in and we'll look at a brand, and, and I won't drop yeah. a name here, but I'll, I'll mention a big shoe company. Let's just say they're a top five shoe manufacturer um, in the world has engaged us today on, on a Web3 project where we are asked to create a consumer app that's going to create an NFT or give you the option to purchase an NFT that's going to lead to a very special shoe. Um, but then ultimately, once we start working with them and digging in, you're right, their technology is three decades old. Correct. They ultimately know very little about the consumer or the consumer journey. And instead of investing all this money in future-facing and forward-thinking technology, they would have been much better served in addressing the legacy technology first. Let's look into, into why that is. 
First, it's around data and compliance. Yeah. So um, if I were sitting on a large legacy stack, the threats to security and compliance grow greater every day because those stacks are not kept up to date. They're not being managed in a fast-moving world um, of of the internet and and just data security. The second is around integration. So now you want to massage that data. You want to create reporting. You want to be able to, you know, act fast. You want to address retention or maybe focus on recruitment. If you don't have easy access to that data in a way that you could run reporting against it or integrate it against other platforms that you want to use, then your legacy system is gonna hold you back. The third one is just in maintenance and upkeep alone. Chances are keeping up a legacy system, um, forget the cost in licenses, that's certainly a big one, but it's costing you more in personnel. And then those personnel don't have the relevant skill set to move you forward into the future. So there are so many things um, that are wrong with companies that seemingly don't want to address it. And they just feel like, well, if I can build a pretty veneer on top of it with my legacy system behind it, then, um, you know, no one's going to know. But the reality is it's what is under the waterline that's really going to determine the success of your business, not what is on top. So once we get in, we'll do is we'll say, let's, let's face this out. Yes. We'll create you this beautiful customer facing app, But we really have to address the underlying problem because if you want us to improve retention, recruitment, or engagement, all of the metrics that you want, that you're trying to have technologies to solve for, you've got to first address the underlying problem. And usually that is legacy systems. Yes, it is. And, and, but I, I, you know, in my own experiences in dealing with, uh, you know, clients or companies that we bought or, or different scenarios, so often that's kind of just an accepted thing and no one even talks about it. Like it's, it's just a thing. Like in, and I, in my experience, it's been, well, if we had to do that, it's almost like a lot of anxiety because it's significant in it's effort and it's not necessarily as apparent as far as a cool, sexy, new thing kind of deal. So I, I, I agree. Yeah. yeah. Is that what you, peep- you, you experience that as well then? Uh, every day, Brian, every day. Um, People lose sleep and are, are are anxious about changing what's been working or supposedly working with them for the last three decades, yep. but they're ready to dive in head first into the cool new thing. I'll be more, more nervous about diving head first into <laughs> the cool new thing than I would be about trying to come up with a plan to transform a business because ultimately that is where change needs to happen. Yes, yes. And a great segue into the whole web dot, it's web 3.0 thing, right? So, and people have heard me talk, speak about this in the past for over the last decade and a half, where people put terms to things. We'll talk about AI in a minute, but, you know, web three is a great example of that, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. It, and where, where people get very excited about the potential, yet the, the real attributes and things that have to make that work are not as easy or as established as you might think. So for the listeners, give us your viewpoint on Web 3. Well, let's start with um, Web 1 and Web 2 were only terms when Web 3 was created. That's okay, right. we, we, we never referred to it's Web right. 1, but, but, but for the listeners, you know, Web 1 now is referred to um, internet protocols, HTTP, um, SMTP, like your email and, and TCP IP. Web two is the the advent of the social networks like Facebook, Twitter, so on. Uh, web three is supposedly, you know, the, the best of web one and, and web two combined, which is an open protocol in a decentralized network. Yeah. So web three, as you mentioned, right, has been gaining a lot of traction. You might have, you know, crypto kicked it off in 2009, this idea of decentralized networks. And then you had the metaverse kind of grow o- over the last couple of years. Um, you had blockchain, you had NFTs. That kind of covers the suite of technologies that make Web3. And we were getting a lot of requests coming in from a lot of our brands and s- saying, we want to engage in Web3 technologies. And before we do anything, and this kind of goes, this is part of you know, our DNA, before we go and just build something for you, we are going to tell you what the ROI is. We're going to say, if you're going to spend half a million dollars on this suite of technologies, 
you're going to make two, three X that within a year, um, or you're not. But we knew very little about it. So we spent a full year uh, learning everything we could about Web3, including building our own POCs, our own prototypes. I became a miner. I understood what that's about. Yep. And ultimately, where we landed um, after a whole year was that the concepts behind Web3, decentralization, um, and, and a few others are solid concepts, but you could build them today with Web2 technologies. Um, why put something on the blockchain? Like, What is the inherent value of it for you today? Even five years from now, there is no value oh, right now. I, that's right. Um, so, so that's so I think, you know, but everybody wanted to build the metaverse and everybody wanted to have an NFT. Um, and I think, look, if you want to dabble in new technology, I love that because that's what we do every single day. We love exploring bleeding edge technology, but there's a difference between exploring something and then the implementation of it. So kind of where we ended up on, on Web3 is... Um, I don't know when the time is going to come for Web3. It could be five years, it could be 10 years. The concepts behind them, I think, are there are some really good concepts around, around how they manage data, around decentralization uh, that I think we could carry forward. But but as a as a suite of technologies, I, I just don't see it impacting, especially our, like, how is it going to make people live better lives? I don't see that happening today. Yeah, and, and, and more to the point of legacy, um, you know, you have to get so many participants uh, into these ecosystems to make it viable. Uh, it takes a lot of time. And until those use cases are really established, you're really kind of just, uh, you know, you're just spending money on stuff that isn't necessarily going to mean anything. And when you're looking at a Nike, for example, that's doing something or a, or a Walmart, yeah, Walmart or whomever, they are not like most businesses. These are companies that are doing it as much to get attention in the media as they are really addressing real business case opportunities. They, and they can afford to do that, right? I mean, they're one of the handful that have the money and resources to kind of just go, let's see what this looks like. Uh, or Starbucks with what they've done with their with yeah. their mobile app. But these are businesses that are much further down the road, have much more access to capital. To well, and, and, and it has no impact, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, for them, uh, their investment in Web3 could be the cost of a Super Bowl commercial, actually far less than the cost of, of one of their single Super Bowl commercials. That's that's right. And so context is king when we look at these things. Yet you'll talk to other people in businesses that aren't quite as big or they've never run a Super Bowl commercial and they will tell you vehemently why they need to move into Web.3. <laughs> and you go right. 3.0 and you go, what the hell are you talking yeah. about? Yeah, and, 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 and reality, again, you know, the, the tech industry does a great job yep. sometimes, a little bit like the pharmaceutical industry too. And if, if you and look at both of these, right? None of these are friendly for, for wellness. Yeah. The pharmaceutical industry creates a problem and then put, like locks around it right. when really the prescription might be exercise or better diet. Right. Um, sometimes there are so many new technologies. And, you know, as we talked about earlier, venture capitalists are obsessed with getting, you know, a hundred X return on something, but they will make the need. So I think we have to look at it really pragmatically and say, how is this going to help our, like, like you mentioned, you know, small to mid-sized business and ultimately how is this going to help our consumer lead better lives? And that, that's the question that I ask every single day in everything that we implement is ultimately, is this going to make someone's life better in, in whatever way? And if it's not, why are we doing it? Yes. Real use cases. And although we all know that uh, Google one day will die and the search engine will change. Uh, Chad GPT is not going to eliminate Google's business model in the next 12 months. You can go to the bank on that from me. Uh, but there are a lot of people that jump to those conclusions. And again, I think it's a combination of a lot of things that you've outlined. And I think you're so right. Um, a similar technology, but different. So we talked about machine learning and what people are talking about is AI, particularly around Chat uh, GPT. Um, this is another interesting thing where words like Web 3.0 mean things differently to different folks, um, wherein AI, machine learning, and these kind of components, uh, where we're talking about data, utilizing data, right? That That's a little different than Web 3.0, correct? It is very different than, than Web 3. Um, and, and that technology is not necessarily even bundled together with Web 3. By the way, 
I don't know if you're going to make this intro, but on on chat GPT, but that's like been the thing. And now yeah. is everyone makes these intros and they're reading it. I'm like, this is really bad English. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I won't use it. I fooled around with Dolly and those, of course, with open AI for a lot long time as, as I know you have, but, but no, I will not use that tool for that intro. You'll be glad. I to appreciate know. it because <laughs> it's going to be butchered. That's right. But tell us about that. Tell us what your views are on data machine learning and, and AI. Yes, yeah, so I think unlike Web3, there actually are real use case and applications using AI today that we could leverage. And there are a bunch of companies that we're working with that use AI. So, But, but there's a lot to unpack when you use AI. So this new chat GPT, um, there's a lot that they've done to kind of make that engine happen. I think it's a good showcase yes. of how... AI can work and what the potential of it might be. But to your point, everyone's kind of running towards it, <laughs> rushing to find a business use case, and we're just not going to be exploring that option. But when you look at AI, there are tools like jasper.ai that can help you write a blog post. Um, there are tools like Dolly that you mentioned, great to generate images, you know, if 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 that's what you're if that's what you're looking for, quicker and faster than ever before. Is it going to ultimately replace human conscience in the next five or 10 years? Probably not. And, I, and, I, and you're saying no, right? Um, because there's always going to be that certain level of comprehension that you're just not going to get from a product that scours the internet. That's essentially what you know, chat GPT is. It, it's a modern day web crawler, but it contextualizes data a lot differently. With that said, though, how do we use AI? And, and how do we use machine learning? So I think there's a few, so there's there's three things to note. You've got artificial intelligence, below that you've got machine learning, and below that you have deep learning. Okay. So, and, and all three of them mean different, thing. different things. Yep. Um, we have dabbled in not deep learning, which is what, for instance, Tesla uses for its autopilot. We have worked quite a bit in AI and machine learning. And there's a couple of cases that, I can immediately tell you how we've used it. So for instance, I'll, I can say this publicly, an application like Beachbody, yeah. when we look at the recommendations that we drive to you towards the programs that we recommend, yes, we're looking at your user data. We're looking at what the people like that fit your profile might find more success in. And we're using AI tools to help generate those types of results. Um, we have another application. You and I kind of talked about this more recently with Speed Fitness as, as an example. Yes. We use vision AI there to help you move better. So we might say, you know, we may track emotion over time and we might be able to say, hey, you know what? You seem like you've injured this part of your body. Therefore, you cannot squat like this. So we're going to tell you potentially how to squat better. Um, so it becomes a tool for rehab and physical therapy and so on. So for us, we've leveraged AI more recently. And I think the data side to help drive hyper-personalized recommendations, and on the vision side, to drive engagement, um, corrective behavior, and other types of actions like that. Yeah, that's which is all very much real. I mean, this is all real stuff. There's very specific use cases that make a heck it's, of a it, lot of sense. It's here today. Right. It is happening right now, and it's going to get better as, as we continue to apply them. Uh, yes, I agree with you. I don't think that true sent sentient uh ai machines are going to be here for a while but, maybe not in our lifetime but yeah yeah, it, yeah 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 i think i think probably before my demise uh i think we'll see at least things that appear to be that way we're already seeing that now but uh but you're right i mean it, it these are real real business tools that are going to increasingly be the stuff that is used every day and we're using it now as you pointed out uh, you know, if you're using, uh, you know, your GPS uh, for different things on applications, yeah. believe me, it has AI components in it. Uh, your Alexa does, your search engines, uh, your Amazon suggested shopping, as you point out with Beachbody, Netflix's offering system is being. So all this stuff is very real today, unlike other things. But I think if you talk to most people with general knowledge of tech, some might think that uh, AI is as utilized as Web 3.0 or the metaverse when it's just, that's just not the case. That's just not the case. And I think the other big difference too is over the next five years or 10 years, definitely in 10 years, 
system. You will see an element of AI in implemented in everything that you do, including, you know, tools like what we're on today with Zoom. It's going to help us, you know, look better. It's going to clean up the image. It's, it's going to clean up the audio. That's not the case of Web3, right? I cannot say that in five or 10 years, Web3 is going to be a part of every single application that we use. But I certainly could see, even if you look at our world, it could help you with gym management software, help you with recruiting people better, converting people better, engaging people better. So AI is going to be around. It's going to play a major role in kind of how we live and work. Um, so again, very different than Web3. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm so glad Zoom will be making our my video appearance look better, Mo. That's, you look that's great already, Brian. Best. That's the best. Are you, are you using AI today? <laughs> yes, I must be. <laughs> I must be. No, we we use it in all kinds of tools and we're continuing to do that. In our marketing agency, of course, we use it and we use it in all kinds of different different tools that leverage the technology. So it's, it is here to stay, and there are going to be many, many, many emerging applications that rely on it in the months and, and years ahead. There's no doubt. I think you're spot on. So given, given all of your background, Mo, and again, thanks so much uh, for the listeners, of course. In the show notes, we'll have links to Mo's profile, Sweatworks, more descriptions so you can easily connect with Mo uh, and learn more about what, uh, what he's about and what his company does. But Given all of your experience and, and the things you share today, I always like to ask our esteemed guests to share some pearls of wisdom uh, that they've uh, kind of uh, cu- accumulated over the years of running their own companies, uh, you know, dealing with new ideas, um, you know, implementing new things. Are there some pearls that you can share with the listeners today, Mo, they may find a value? Well, I, look, there's probably a lot of pearls that I've you know, learned over time. Um, one of it is, let me, let me think about that is, is probably when you make a decision, be decisive about it and, and run with it. Um, I've made some mistakes in the past where I've tried to please everyone either internally or externally, and you end up adding all these ingredients into your salad and it's a horrible salad, mm-hmm. right? Um, pick the things that are meaningful to you and, and as the leader, pick a direction and go, you will gain a lot more respect from that. But as it, I think, relates to what we do in terms of technology um, and engagement, it, it's really what we started this, the, or the theme of this of this podcast has been, which is don't run towards the shiny new object. Um, I would wait. I would always take a step back. I would look at it from afar, understand it, and you're not going to miss out. So this feeling of FOMO, which seemingly has taken over a lot of the world today, I mean, as a technologist, I mean, you're a technologist as well. You know, we're telling you um, not to run towards the shiny new thing because it's not what we're doing. That's right. Um, that's going to be a distraction. So I think, you know, but you need to have a sound strategy. You have to be constantly thinking about change mm-hmm. and technology iterates all the time. So just because you've implemented something, it doesn't stop. You have to have a plan that, okay, you've, you've made an investment, but you've now got to feed that investment and it's got to continue to go on. So a lot of people look at, tech maybe as, hey, I'm going to go launch an app. I'm going to launch this digital product. It's now done. That's how products fail. So you have to continue to nurture it, maintain it, and support it. No, great, great, great insights. Now, um, I'm sure the community that listens in on this will be attending various events in the coming weeks and months. I know we have Ursa in San Diego, and I assume, Mo, you'll be there for that event. I'm definitely going to be at Ursa. You know, we we had a, a great event last year. We're going to have the same event again this year on that first Monday. I look forward to seeing a lot of the community there. I'm also going to be at Connected Fitness, which is coming up uh, in a week in LA. Uh, I've got a couple others kind of planned for this for this year as well. So we'll we'll be at FIBO. We'll be at Al's event here, um, which is going to which is back here in DC again now. So I'm excited about that. Great. I will see you at those events as well. And uh, for the listeners, again, check out the show notes for all the details on those events where you can see the Sweatworks team and say hello to Mo in person. Mo, thank you so much for sharing your insights and views uh, with the listeners today. We really appreciate your time and uh, wisdom. Thanks for having me on, Brian. I really appreciate it. Hello, listeners. This is Brian O'Rourke. And thanks so much for listening to the Fitness Plus Technology Podcast. The podcast is made possible by the Fitness Industry Technology Council, a consortium of global brands working together to enhance the adoption of technologies in the fitness space. 
our company, Videri Ventures, which is invested in Vertimax, Montezumo, Gold's Gym, Houston, Texas, and Fitness 24-7 Thailand, also underwrites the podcast, along with our service companies, Integris Advisors, Moon Mission Media, and others. Please feel free to share this podcast with your colleagues. And if I can be of any assistance to you, don't hesitate to reach out, briankorourke at gmail.com or find me on any of the major social networks. Have a great day and thanks for listening.